Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are now on our sixth and final lecture on the functions. So last time we talked about some of those sticky points, um, and last week we focused on a lot of the nuts and bolts and how to actually create the functions. And so today we're going to finish up with some things that I consider to be the advanced concepts about the function. Some of, the, some of these things will be related to some of the things we've talked about before. Um, some of these things I think are um, looking at some of the things we've talked about in a different way that's a little bit more advanced than perhaps how we initially had uh, mentioned this to you. So let's go ahead and get started. As usual, you can follow along in the video or on your own copy, which you can get from our webpage. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk through is how a function call execution works. And this has to do with that imaginary pointer that we've been talking about that keeps track of where the code is at. Linear would run from top to bottom, but this is our first example of flow control where you can have the function call cause that imaginary pointer to go to a new place that is the beginning of the function at the definition line, and then it will execute the function. So let's just see what the order is. First of all, the function arguments will be evaluated. So it may be that they need to be um, put into canonical form because they may be not reduced. So if you have uh, two plus two, then it's gonna need to be resolved to four. Second, a new variable table is created assigning the argument values to the function parameters. Remember that the function call involves the variable assignment uh, to the parameters. Uh, and so that will cause the variable table to open up and those new ones will be entered into the variable table in their new scope. That is the scope of that local function because all parameters are going to be local variables. Control is passed to the beginning of the function body. So we're gonna move into the statements. Control flows normally within the function body until a return statement is encountered. Now, do you remember though, that we had that uh, page on the returns, right? The return does two things. First of all, it is the stop sign, terminates the execution of the function. And the second thing that it does is it sends out that Amazon box. And the question is always, what's in the box? Is there something in there? Is there somebody to receive that box? So, but when we hit the return, it's concerned with sending that box out. The expression following the keyword return is evaluated or the end of the body is reached, whichever comes first. So either way, it will be processed as a return. If no return is explicitly found, then return none is implied at the end of the indented block. If no expression follows return, then return none will be implied. The function's variable table is erased. It's destroyed forever and all the local variables are gone. The only thing that survives is whatever gets put into that Amazon box. You could have also had a change in the environment instead of returning something like drawing a picture or um, printing something to the screen. That could have happened, but that does not cause any change of information when a return is hit because that information is lost to the program forever. So the function's variable table is erased. The return value is assigned to the value of the function call. So if you had A equals, and then your function call, A will get that value. If you didn't catch it in anything, it will just simply be sent out. It's like an Amazon box that got sent, but was never delivered anywhere. And control is returned to the function call site. We can use the function call graphs in order to keep track of how this proceeds. This is similar to making your stack diagram. And so the call graphs are very useful for keeping track of all of the values and variables that are involved. So here is a couple of functions. Let's just take a look at what the functions are doing. Add and greet takes X and Y. I'm purposely not putting the signature on here. It is a variable that's gonna be the sum of X and Y. Oh, there's a function call in the middle of it. And there's also a return it in here. I also have another function, it's called greet user. This one doesn't take any inputs. And we also have an it in this one. And uh, it is equal to the result of printing hi there. 
And out in main, we have x equals 39 and y equals adding read 1 plus 2, which needs to be resolved and an x. All right, so there's a lot going on here. And so this is a great one to make a call graph for because that will help us keep track of all of the things that are going on. Let's see what the program does by drawing its call graph, which is very similar to the spec, but it has a few added pieces of information here. All right, so we're going to begin with out and main. Those are the things that are not inside the functions. Remember, just because you have functions defined does not mean that the functions are actually running. So as that pointer goes along, it is going to say, oh, I'm going to learn how to add and read. Great. Oh, I can also read the user now, know how to do that, but I'm not doing it yet, right? And then we get the value of x equals 39. This is a variable assignment, and this causes an entry in the variable table, which we're going to be showing it like this inside of a box, x gets the value of 39 from this variable assignment here. And y gets the value of, all right, well, it says 42 here because I've completed the exercise, but uh, we, need to, we need to go and find out what that is. So when we have y equals n read of one plus two comma x, this is going to send out the value of, well, what is one plus two? It's three, so it sends out three, and x gets the value of 39, which we can also find from the variable table. So we are going to write these over the arrows to indicate that this is the information that is being sent out of the function as we proceed to the next place. So we're going to proceed to the add and greet function. So here we're going to now make this box here for add and greet. That's the name of this function. And we have sent out the values of 3 and 39. And we can see from here that 3 and 39 will match to x and y. And we recall that when you have a function call, the implicit variable assignment occurs. So x gets the value 3 and y gets the value of 39 to match up with these inputs. Now there's also a variable called it. And it is equal to x plus y. So um, it will be equal to 39 plus 3, which is equal to 42. So it gets the value of 42. OK, now the next thing that happens is, oh, it's a function call in the middle of the function. All right, well, we're going to send something out. Well, what are we sending out? Well, notice that there's nothing here. So it just sends out the empty parentheses. There's actually no information being sent out. And where does it go? Oh, it goes to greet user. Okay, so we draw another box. This one's for greet user. We put the name at the top. No variable assignments because there are no parameters. All right. And now we have another it. Oh, but we had an it over here. Yes, but they are distinct it's because they are in different functions. So they are in a different scope from each other, just as these X and Ys are in different scope from these ones over here. Notice they have different values. All right, so what is it going to be equal to? It is the result of, oh, another function call, function call to Python built-in print. So we're going to make a function call out to print. It's going to send the expression hi there, which I've abbreviated because I ran out of space. And so we'll send out the string hi there, just like this, to print, which will presumably display that on the screen. What does What is returned from print? Is it hi there? No, it is not. Hi there is displayed on the screen. That's an environmental effect. Print, in fact, returns none. So. Print returns none, so where does the none go back to? Oh, well, it goes back to the it. It equals the result of the printing. Well, the result of the printing return got a none, so now it gets none. So it gets the value of none. Okay, that's the end of greet user. So that means we can go back to the thing they call it, called greet user. Now, sometimes students are tempted to make their pointer go down like this in a linear fashion, but don't forget you have to follow the rules. You have to go back to the thing that called it and greet user was called from up here. So that imaginary pointer needs to go back. Now there's no return here. So what, what happens? Well, when you don't have an explicit return and the indentation stops, then there is an implicit return. And in fact, it's a return none because there's nothing here. So that means we um, return none. So we go back now to the add and greet function. And now here's the greet user. Did that actually capture anything? No, it didn't because there's nothing here to catch it, but that's fine. 
Okay, and now we're back to this it, return it. Well, which it should it return? We have an it over here, which is equal to none. And we have an it over here, which is equal to 42. Which one should it return? Well, because we're inside of the add and greet, that means we must choose the one that's inside that scope. Don't forget that because greet user is complete, this variable table, in fact, no longer even exists. So now we're going to return it to the sender, um, to, the, to the caller of this function, add and greet, and add and greet had been down here. So it gets the value of 42 from add and greet because that's where we are. And 42 gets written over the arrow as we proceed back to the original call. And that came from y equals the function call for add and greet of one comma two plus uh, one and plus two comma x. And this is how we get back the value 42 finally to the original y out in main. Complicated stuff. There's a lot of steps here, but I hope you'll, you can see how this works and see that the call graphs are actually really useful. I love making them because the call graphs actually have all the information you could ever need. It includes the information about the stacks because you can follow the arrows. It has the information about the variable tables because the variable tables are written inside. It also handles scope because the squares or the rectangles um, de delineate the, the, the different scopes that are being involved. And we also are keeping track of what information is being sent out by each of the function calls. Getting back to those returned values, you have to use something in order to capture a value that gets returned. Simply returning the value is not enough to use it out in main or any other function that may have run the function. In order to capture the value of something returned by a function, you must capture it in a variable or as the input for another function. So here we have a function called double of n and it will return n plus n, very simple function. So here we do double of three and we get back six. Now, if you run this interactively, which I really, really don't want you to do because functions really belong in scripts. But if you did this for some reason, you might say, oh, guess what there, look, it's in main. You were wrong, but actually that's not the whole story. If you run interactively, the value will appear on the screen, but you cannot use it again, just like when it is printed. And that's because inside of these little chevrons actually is a, like an implicit print. And that's why it showed up on the screen. But just because you printed it doesn't mean you can actually use it. If you run from a script, the value will be returned. However, you will not see it unless you explicitly print it. So here we have a case where we have some script and we have def double in the script, which is much better. It's gonna return n plus n, great. And so here we have x equals double of two. And then if you print x, you, can, you will be able to see it. But of course you need to run the function and you need to have the print x to actually be able to see it. So if you run from the script, the value will be returned. However, you will not see it unless you explicitly print it. Here's the explicit print. Return the value to a variable, which is then printed, which is what you could do. Or you could return the value as input to a print function, which is generally the acceptable thing to do. So here we have print, and then we have <clears throat> the variable, I mean, the function call right inside of it. And so this is really great because this illustrates composition and it's a little bit more compact in this way, but you could really do this either way. And just to keep me honest, I have shown you the output down here. All right, a few points about the functions. You can call another function from within the function. We've seen several examples of this now. Functions can be chained together just like in math. This is called the composition. So you have one function inside of another function. It's just like resolving those parentheses in the long line of um, those problems of uh, figuring out uh, order of operation. Print and return are two distinct entities. They're not the same thing. Print causes something to be displayed on the screen, which is changing of colors of pixels and shapes of numbers and letters. That is not the same thing as providing information back to your program, which is what you need to use return for. All functions return something, but the return is implicit if no explicit return statement is used. So you may not see it, but it's always there. Implicit returns, return the value of none, which has the type of none type. 
So if you don't specifically say an expression after a return, or if your return is implicit anyways, then you will return the, the none type. Um, well, you return none, which is a none type. So that means you get that null symbol in the Amazon box, which has no information. This is a little practice problem I put together for you. Here's a program with two functions, uh, which both double the input. So here we have a uh, def double A and uh, def double B. So we have these two functions. This return is n plus n, and this one prints n plus n onto the screen. Which function prints something? This one doesn't have any prints, so this one does not print anything. But this function will print the answer to the screen. Which function returns something? You may be tempted to say this one does, but this one does not. But don't forget, because all functions return something, just some functions return none. And this is an example of a function that returns none because the return is implicit. You can draw the call graph to illustrate the difference between each of these. The key difference is this one returns none implicitly, whereas this one returns an actual value. All right, well then, that concludes our discussion about the functions. We have now covered quite a few topics here. We have talked about the overview of the functions and how to define the functions. We've looked at the variables and their scopes inside of functions. This is very important because when your function terminates, the variables that are inside the function will be lost forever. And the only way to save them is to send them out in an expression in the return statement, which then needs to be captured or used in composition in order to make use of that in something outside of the function. We've also talked about the, the Python built-in functions, looking at the math. We have talked about the fruitful functions, um, which return things and the various kinds of things that they could return. We've also been introduced to the stack to see how we can trace back those variables. We have talked about a number of sticky points that might be a little bit challenging for you. And today we have also finished up with some of those advanced concepts. So great job with learning functions. I'm sure that in the beginning, they seem a little bit foreign and perhaps not that useful, but I hope you have seen the value of actually taking the time to get to know how to use functions and are now getting much more comfortable with working with them. This also concludes the materials up to our first exam. So we will have some review materials for you to take a look at and, um, and on both functions and the other topics we've covered in the course so far. So congratulations on getting through some of the worst of it. Um, I hope that our videos have made this clear for you and we look forward to meeting up with you next time. All right, thanks so much, everybody. We will see you later. Bye-bye.